two sides to the meditation, the tranquility side and the insight side. And a lot of the insight has to come from the tranquility. It's a combination of two things. One is getting the mind to be still, and then secondly, learning how to ask the right questions. The Buddha sets them out in the Four Noble Truths, questions related to suffering and the end of suffering. And he said other questions, if they relate to this issue, okay, they can be useful. Otherwise, you want to put them aside. And you look at the questions that most of us ask ourselves in the course of the day, really are distractions. Worried about what this person thinks about us, worried about that, what that person thinks about us, what this person's going to do, what that person's going to do, why they did something in the past. And as the Buddha said, the real cause for suffering isn't out there, it's inside our own minds. And so you want to focus on the questions that keep bringing you back to your mind. What are you doing right now? What are the results of what you're doing? Can you see that clearly? If you can't see it clearly, try to make the mind more still. When it's still, you can say, okay, can you, can you keep it still for a while? See what happens when you try to keep it still. And in the beginning, it's going to be difficult because the mind's not used to being still, but you work at it day after day after day, and finally it becomes a whole set of new habits in the mind. Of course, it would be nice if it were a nice, steady progress. It has its ups and downs. But over the long run, if you keep at it, the mind will find it more and more natural to come to a place of stillness. And as we get there, sometimes even before we get there, insights arise in the mind. As John Fu used to say, don't memorize your insights. If they're really worthwhile, he said, they'll stick with you. And the important issue, okay, do they apply to what's going on in your mind right now? If not, just put them aside. If they do apply, use them and then put them aside. In other words, you don't have to go with a, around with a ready-made bag of little, little insight gems that you carry around with you and you bring out every now and then. You're trying to create the quality of mind that will give rise to insight when it's needed at all times. This is why there's so much emphasis on meditating, not only when you're sitting here with your eyes closed, but trying to keep the same sense of inner center, this inner balance, this inner steadiness going throughout the day. Because when the mind is still like that, okay, then you, you see things that you wouldn't see otherwise. And that's what enables insight to arise. It's like the old story about the goose and the golden egg the insights of the golden eggs. And we just want to collect the golden eggs as we carry them around. Okay, we, there's no time for the goose. So the goose dies. And then it turns out the eggs don't last very long. They're not really gold. They're gold for a little while, and then they turn into something else. What you want is the goose that keeps on laying the golden eggs right when you need them. And that's why the practice of concentration has to be consistent, has to be constant, gaining the center for the mind, and just dealing with whatever, whatever issues come up that pull you away. The part of you that says, that's too difficult, that's too hard, that's too much of an effort. There's so much of modern American Dharma that places an emphasis on being effortless, having a fluid life, fluent life that can move from this to the next, and that's it, all very easy. It's all very natural and relaxed. And yes, you do want to have a state of mind that is relaxed, but there is work involved in keeping that state steady. And just the simple relaxation is enough. You have to be looking, curious, asking questions at the right time, all of which requires effort. After all the Buddhist teachings on karma emphasize intention. It's our intentions that shape everything. 
and we're practicing concentration, we're, we're taking an intention and trying to make it as steady as possible. See the power of our intentions, how they can shape our lives, how they can really make a difference, so that you don't have to be subject to the flow all the time. Because where is the flow going to take you? It can take you all kinds of places. If you look at your mind right now, there are lots of different currents. Some are pulling you towards the Dharma, some are pulling you away. And you've got to make up your mind. Where do you really want to go with your life? Those currents that pull you away, exactly what do they have in mind? Where do they end up? Usually off in the shallow someplace. And they're not pleasant shallows either. It's like the shallows in Lake Powell, where all the oil and gasoline and all the garbage in the lake tends to, tends to collect, up in those little side canyons. You ask yourself, is that where you want to go? Okay, if you don't want to go that way, you've got to make up your mind that okay, even though those currents are there and sometimes they're strong, you're not going to go along with them. And this is where the power of intention comes in. These images that we get thrown around, going with the flow, trusting interdependence, interconnectedness, that's another big one. Because it's not that when you're interconnected, you're only connected to good things. You're connected to everything that's around in the world, the good and the bad, leaving you open on all sides. When we think about it, when you're born with this human body, it's like you've got this big, gaping wound that you've got to care for. This is why we have the reflections on the requisites every night. It's not that the body can just sit here and be perfectly happy day after day after day without needing anything. It needs food, it needs clothing, it needs shelter, it needs medicine. You can't sit in one position for many days to know you've got to get it up, you've got to walk it around, lie it, lay it down. There's a lot of work involved in this body, and because there's so much, the body is so needy, that's why we're so dependent on other people, other things. This is the nature of our interconnectedness. We need to feed. We need the nourishment. And that's why we lack freedom. So it's not necessarily a good thing, this interconnectedness. People tell us that we want to have a life where we can dance the dance of interconnectedness and go with the flow. It all sounds very nice and easy, but it just doesn't work up, work out. You end up in those those shallows in the side canyons. Where the old oil drums and the oil slicks and who knows what kind of garbage and dead animals are lying in the shallows. So you've got to make the best effort to stay with the main current, the current that flows in the other direction. Flows to the Dharma, flows to the deathless. That's the current you want to get into. And it takes effort, but the effort pays off. It's like this ability to keep the mind fresh and concentrated. And that way you get fresh insights instead of having to carry around old, stale insights. When the mind is still, it just sees what's going on. It sees what the problem is, or it has the potential to see what the problem is. If it's not only still, but also asking the right questions. And some of the, sometimes the issue is just that. Be extra still. Stay very still. Just watch what's going on. Other times you realize you're just sitting there is not enough. You've got to do something. You've got to maybe let this go, let that go. Are you? Whereas there's still some disturbance in the mind. When the mind is really still, and it's been still for a long time, you can begin to see these things that you wouldn't see otherwise. Sometimes, sometimes it's a question of just sitting there and watching, and other times it's making decisions. In ways that will bring the mind even greater stillness, greater stability. But it's in the doing, in the maintaining the stillness, and in asking the questions. That's what makes a difference. So instead of lugging old insights around, when, as you do these things, you get the mind in the proper state. Its nature is to see things. It is to solve problems, once you've got it in the proper place. In 
it's only that way that you can gain insights that you didn't expect. And it's the unexpected insights that really do make a difference. Otherwise, it's the same stuff, just rehashed over and over and over again. And sometimes it's useful and sometimes it's not. We tend to say, well, that's just the way it is with the world. But it doesn't have to be that way. If the mind gets more sensitive, more in tune to what's going on in the present moment, and what the real issues are in terms of stress and suffering and the end of stress and suffering, you begin to see a lot of things that you didn't see otherwise, you wouldn't see otherwise. It's because of the doing. It's because you have the intention that you really do want to put an end to this suffering once and for all. And what's recorded is a John Munn's last sermon. He says, that's the one thing you've got to maintain at all times is your determination never to come back and suffer in this world again. He says, once you've got that kind of fighting determination, all the other qualities in the path come together to maintain that determination. But that's the, the crucial element. It's based on insight, understanding the nature of suffering. It's based on compassion, realizing that you don't want to have that suffering continue. And so use the practices of concentration. Use the the questions that will develop insight in ways that maintain, maintain that determination, make it strong, and see it through to its end. That's the kind of life you lead when you practice in the Dharma. When you realize you've got that, that opportunity, there is that That way of life is available. It is an option. You begin to wonder why you'd want any other way of life at all. 